Ghost. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, 7 o'clock in New York, so there's cheering outside. Uh, oh, that's so great. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the, uh, the joyful noise to... Uh, oh, I wish I could cheer. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Powerhouse Arena's virtual event series. Uh, my name is Chris, and we're very excited to host the launch of Ellen O'Connell Widdit's What You Become in Flight. You can buy the book at powerhousebookstores.com. Uh, the link is in the event page, and it is also reposted in the chat, which is to the right of your screen. Uh, Ellen will be joined in conversation uh, with by Chloe Angel. And I'll let, uh, let me introduce them both now. Uh, Chloe Angel is a contributing editor at marieclaire.com and the author of the forthcoming book, Turning Point. Ellen O'Connell with it is an essayist and lecturer, winner of the Virginia Faulkner Award. Her work has appeared in Vulture, Paris Review, Buzzfeed, Teen Vogue, and Prairie Schooner. This is her first book. I, you'll all be able to ask questions to the uh, function on your screen, the function on your screen. And I'll, I'll hand it over now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome from Iowa and Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> um, uh, I thought we'd start with a, a reading from you, Ellen. Yeah. Um, from this beautiful, complicated book that I really, really enjoyed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been kind of um, cycling through a few different passages um, for virtual events. So I'm gonna go with one right now about um, a complicated experience with an understudy. Um, the understudy's name was Caitlin, just to give a little background. And, um, what's happening at this point in the book. So this book, by the way, What You Become in Flight is about my life as a ballet dancer and um, a sort of career ending injury that was the result of many injuries that I ignored along the way. Um, so at this point in the book, I'm about 16 and two dancers from the Bolshoi in Kirov, a married couple, came to my ballet studio when I was a teenager and staged a ballet called Don Quixote on us. And I had the role of Cupid and I had an understudy that I had a strange relationship with. So the very small costume I was to wear as Cupid smelled like cigarette smoke and had small gauzy wings. Upstairs above the studio, the seamstress and Olga pulled the fabric away from my skin. From my skin is too big here, Olga said, and not big enough here. I stood on a stool and turned around and around, and then when I stepped down, they looked at my measurements with genuine concern. The costume mistress pinned me in, and I told myself that although the pins made the costume feel tight, by the performance, I'd make sure it was loose again by losing some weight. I wanted to be able to take a full breath and to see folds of fabric over my sternum when I exhaled. My costume, I realized, must fit for the ballet to go on. Without my costume, we could not have my scene. And without my scene, there would be no performance. Caitlin tried it on after and showed me places where it was too big for her, even after it was pinned for me. This is not a story where someone crashes or falls or is beat up. This is a story where Caitlin pushed her hands into my feet each day until one day she sat on them instead and I didn't protest. After all, I wanted them to curve for the floor like a body bends against the cold. When Caitlin sat, there was a gentle and slow crack. We were sitting in the hallway before a class in our rubber pants, and girls around us heard it too. They lay on their backs with their legs in the air, or pushed against a wall, forcing their stretches a little more. There were bodies everywhere, and they all froze for the second when we heard the crack inside my foot, and then the second was a long time passing. Oops, Caitlin said, dramatically grimacing, her hand covering my feet. I was silent and focused inward or downward to the sharp and steady pain in my right foot and began counting how many days were left until our performance to assure myself that I would recover in time to dance the role of Cupid. 
I had accepted violence from Caitlin and inflicted it on myself. That's okay, I told everyone, it's my fault. I asked her to, it will be fine. I was cheerful, insistent, near tears. People stood and the air moved wildly around us all. Someone handed me a bag of ice and wrapped it around my foot with a leg warmer. From inside the studio, the slow music of the Grand Allegro at the end of another class hung in the light. Caitlin was Cupid that night in our rehearsal, dancing my part as I watched from the floor. Although she knew each step, I knew she was not as good as I was and would never be allowed to dance that part. Bodies were the enemy after all, whether they belonged to us or to the girls we danced alongside. We competed for Syat's halting accented praise, for Olga's eyes to trace us as we danced. We were two women competing for one role. My foot didn't swell immediately, but by the time I unwrapped it in front of Olga after rehearsal, it was round and hot. Her eyes darted around, searching the room for a solution. I saw the wisps of hair at the nape of her neck when she turned her head from side to side and in her face and her form was something I had not seen before. It looked like pride. I learned from her face the necessity of sacrificing the body to contort it into something perfect. The room was mostly dark, but for a few overhead lights buzzing, streaming over our heads and then down to the floor. She leaned over me in the semi-dark and I knew she wanted me to give my life to ballet right then as she had done, to be tougher than physical pain, to dance anyway. With my foot still in her lap, I lay down on the floor submitting. I am here, my mother said, coming in the doorway and like a miracle she was. Someone had called her to come take me to the doctor. If I had known at age 15 the exquisite violence that would follow in the years to come, two ruptured discs and fractured spine, the dislocated collarbone, the eating disorder, the sprains and tears and rejection, I would still have stretched out there on the floor and surrendered to ballet, would still let Olga move my foot around in her hands and assess whether I had what it took to dance through injury while my mother worried in the doorframe. I was always powerless before the stories I told and the roles I danced in order to earn love. We went to an orthopedic surgeon soon after and on the white exam table, I made up my mind that I would not be absent from the theater in a few weeks. Last season, I had already sustained a sprained hip flexor and dislocated my pelvis. The doctor predictably and perhaps wisely told me not to dance, but if I had been the type to laugh in his face, I would have. I thought he was the one who didn't understand. Years later, I see that I am. One of the things I love about that passage is that it has so many of what people imagine to be the sort of stereotypical images. Like if you were making a movie about a young ballet student, you would have the girls with their legs against the wall lying in the hallway. Like it's almost like stock imagery. You have a photo of a foot in some kind of distress. It like, And then it goes so much deeper than that. And it's not about like, yes, it's about two women competing for one part, but it's also so much about the internalized consent to pain um, that I think gets missed in a lot of the sort of popular imagery of what it is to dance and what it is to like live in a, in a dancer's body. Um, and it's such amazing foreshadowing for so much of what comes next. Like the, I'm thinking about the four phrases that you said to the girls around you. You said, that's okay. It's my fault. I asked her to, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And like, that's just such a fantastic summary of so many of the responses to pain and violence in this book, whether it's inflicted by another woman or by yourself or by a man, that's okay. It's my fault. I asked them to, I'll be fine. And it's such a good, yeah, think... sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think that it's easy to show um, Caitlin as, because we were competing for the same role as an antagonist, but I actually think that we were both playing this game, which was we both thought, oh, this will help. Ellen wants her feet to arch, you know, more, better, higher, whatever, and this will help. So I, I genuinely think she thought she was helping me, and I, I genuinely thought this would help. Um, and the, that's sort of a lie that both of us bought into and were able to um, injure ourselves with. Yeah, and injure each other with. Yeah, and injure each other with. Um, and it's sort of it's such a great reminder that so much of the uh, so 
so much of the purported knowledge about what is good for your body in dance is passed down from people who don't necessarily know what they're talking about, mm. right? A lot of teachers, at, at least until very recently, didn't really have to complete any real like dance pedagogy mm-hmm. training. Uh, they just, mm-hmm. they had been dancers and that they became teachers. And a lot of, a lot of the dancers that I've interviewed in my work, you know, they learn to starve themselves by watching the older girls in their ballet studios. They learn to make that, you know, they learn to wear, to beat up their point shoes, to, to wear in their point shoes by watching the girls around them. So much of that knowledge is received from like the Caitlin's in our lives. Right. And we really believe that it's true. Yeah. And also remember distinctly seeing a picture of somebody who put her feet under, um, under a couch. A couch. Yeah. Yep. I used to do all the time. And, you know, her feet, like the balls of her big toes touched the ground. So I thought, well, then the human foot can do that. Why can't I do that? Right. And that's just not, that's not my body. And that's, those aren't my feet. So I saw this picture and without thinking much about the danger of those kind of distorted images we so often see of dancers um, doing things that are not natural, but look really beautiful from a distance on certain bodies, I thought, okay, well, that's the right way to do it. And that's what I'm going to do. Right. And there's no sort of, I think, especially when that, when you're that young, but not only when you're that young, there's no mm-hmm. moment to stop and think, maybe I'm actually not built for that. Like maybe right. my body can't safely do that. Mm-hmm. But even if you, reconcile yourself to the fact that that's true there's only one line right there's only one correct shape there's only one uh-huh. correct way for a foot to look in ballet and either you can do it or you can't so even if you uh-huh. reconcile yourself to the fact that you can't where does that leave you and those are the images that we see too i mean i grew up with those images on studio walls or on my own walls that i cut out of you know dance or point magazine because i i thought those are idealized images that's what i'm aiming for yeah. And yet those were different, d- different bodies with different, you know, limitations and structures. And um, that was not something that I talked about or thought about. I just aimed for it. Um, it wasn't until this year that I took a class with a ballet teacher who said, forget what you learned when you were eight, your back isn't built to, we were in attitude on um, releve at the bar. And she was like, yeah, your back's not built to do that. If it hurts, stop doing it, which is an appropriate thing to say to a room of adults who have like paid their own money to be in the room with you and like don't have to hurt themselves. But also I was like, huh, no one ever gave me that option. No one ever said your back may not make this shape. It was just keep working until it does. Exactly. Yeah. That's so much my experience too. Yeah. Um, I've always sort of thought about ballet as a, like a, a metaphor for womanhood or a, you know, a, a, like a distillation of a particular kind of femininity sort of with the volume cranked and the intensity cranked all the way up. Um, but one thing that you write about really, really beautifully in this book is about how it's actually, it's not just a metaphor for womanhood, it's practice for womanhood that starts very, very early. It's a very like classed, gendered and racialized kind of practice for a particular kind of femininity. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, um, that's something of course I didn't realize while I was living it, but you know, the things that I was involved in at age six all the way through 22 when I stopped dancing ballet um, were rehearsals for getting something to be perfect, to be beautiful. There were a lot of story ballets. I was, I was very classically trained. So I was in a lot of different kinds of story ballets and story ballets are, you know, they're sort of like, they're, they're Disney. It's like enchanted, worlds and a sorcerer keeping a woman under lock and key and only true love can free her and of course she can't free herself she has no agency so with many were things, happy endings by the way no no <laughs> i mean many of them yeah many of them she ends up getting killed or killing herself or yes somebody has to die um and yet these seemed so sort of epically tragic to me at the time mm-hmm. and i just thought like that's that's beauty that's art that's that's culture um when in fact i mean i guess the, that's true I, I still have sort of a soft spot for swan lake for example but i don't think that is the only 
uh, definition of ballet. Mm. Um, but I think I was sort of snobby about it because I saw things like modern dance where people were dancing off, you know, in bare feet or soft shoes or something as like you weren't working as hard, which is certainly not true. But I think in the sort of pecking order of dance, that's the, that's the story that I heard or that I understood from ballet is that this was the absolute pinnacle mm -hmm. of feminine beauty. Um, and it's so strict. I mean, I remember having to like get sort of looked over by my teacher ahead of time to make sure like ahead of performances to make sure I didn't have any stray hairs, you know, like she it had to be slicked back with hairspray. Um, you're, you had to tie, tie your ribbons in. Early on in the book, I have a scene where my ribbon comes untied on stage and I just am absolutely freaking out because I think this, that's the end. Like I ruined the spell. Mm -hmm. So, so much of this was artifice, trying to cast a spell for the audience that I felt like I was under because of ballet um, and the, the promise of perfection that you, know, you always chased and obviously never attained because it's a lie. Um, and that is so much of womanhood. I mean, I think that we're always interested in, you know, making sure that we look good from, ang from lots of different angles because, and not, not, I mean, like, I think when you think about idealized womanhood in commercials or TV or movies or, you know, whatever, Instagram, um, that there is such a sort of a, a pose and an artifice to it. And, um, the myths that were told about what it takes to be perfect require a lot of effort, sort of like ballet, a lot of effort to look effortless. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, all of that I think is, it's more than a, it's more than a symbol. It's a, it's a training. Yeah. And especially when you're doing that from age, whatever, five, six onward, that's the image you have. And there's not much room to question. And it's, um, it's such a great, uh, you mentioned Christy Adair, the, the feminist dance scholar in the book, and she writes about how, you know, ballet class is just really an excellent training in silent obedience mm -hmm. in, you know, unquestioningly obeying, obeying, repeating what you see, as you, as you say in the book, ask, you know, only speaking to ask for clarifications or more information, and then certainly not offering opinions on maybe we could do it differently. It's just an excellent practice in obediently, in like silent obedience, um, which yeah, is that's, very, very gendered. Yeah, that's certainly true. And I think, um, you know, I, I talk about this in the book too, that the parts of dance that are passed down or that sort of last past the moment of its occurrence are dominated by men, you know, male choreographers, male artistic directors, male teachers, and then the dance, which sort of evaporates as soon as it happens, is historically done by women. So we are given direction and we are, you know, asked to fulfill that. I remember only one time working with a choreographer who he was a jazz dancer and so he was choreographing something for point and kept asking, does this work? What does that feel like? And I thought that was such a strange question. Like, <laughs> it's, I don't know, we'll make it work. You know, you give us a direction and we'll make it work. Um, and yet, you know, it was like kind of amazing to actually stand back and evaluate, like, does that work? Is that stuff possible on point? Um, and yes, that sort of sub subservience and obedience and silence and acquiescence are all, I think, very gendered experiences that I, I learned early on. I mean, I, I knew what it took to please a teacher mm -hmm. outside of ballet too. I knew what it was like to please adults. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think the counter argument to what, what you just said about how sort of men get the stuff that's sort of written down and recorded and women's contributions are more ephemeral. I think, you know, the counter argument to that is often that, but then the women who were dancers become teachers and they become coaches and they pass down their knowledge of, you know, that ballet that was created on them, they pass it down to the next generation. And there's this sort of great oral, physical, pedagogical tradition that gets passed down that's really, really valuable. Um, but you make this point in the book about how women are only ever muses and they don't get to have muses. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering when did you, so, and so, you know, so many of the famous ballet creators had muses, obviously Balanchine is the most obvious example. He had a series of muses, most of which he was married to at some point. 
um, and with whom he had some really, what I think today we would describe as like a dysfunctional and unacceptable relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and so much of the mythology around those relationships is that it's so great to be a muse. Like what an honor. It's, it's like, it's a, that it makes you eternal to be a muse, right? Eternal in the way that the men get to be by default. And I'm curious about when you realized that those stories that we tell ourselves about musehood were really, really, am I allowed to swear on this soon? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't mind. We're really messed up. Um, so I remember a couple times having something choreographed specifically on me and that always felt like the biggest honor I could mm-hmm. imagine. It was actually, I'm, I think that a couple times it was a woman choreographer, but still, you know, just, just to be in a position to move somebody to create something felt so amazing. And it wasn't until I read about writer's muses, like a completely different world um, that I will to see like, well, yes, I suppose it's wonderful that like, uh, I talk about in the book, I talk about Lucia Joyce, James Joyce's daughter, and also Zelda Fitzgerald, both of them were dancers and, um, you know, acted as sort of muses, but also sort of co-create their Lucia Joyce with her father and Zelda Fitzgerald with her husband. Um, and I think that that actually that's, they were erased because they were doing more than just being beautiful and having somebody inspired because of their beauty, that they were actually working hard and doing something, um, you know, of their own volition, their own agency. Uh, And I felt really sad about the stories that we don't have about them, especially about Lucia Joyce, who ended up in a a mental institution for most of her life. Um, So, and Zelda Fitzgerald, actually. Uh, had mental illness. So I think by seeing it in a different world, I was able to reflect like that's the entire dynamic in ballet. I mean, that's the entire dynamic is that you are creating something with your body and yet you don't just credit it as a dancer. And yet when somebody gives you direction, do this, you know, in this way, you're, you're the one doing it and it exists because your body exists. And that just seems spectacularly unfair. And I just realized that I had been sort of like erased from my own life in in essence, because I had worked so hard to do these things and got got credit in that people told me you did a good job, but that just didn't exist. And even now people will ask me for pictures or videos, you know, for like sort of book promotional purposes. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a lot. I mean, I think also I was a teenager, you know, pre-social media, so I wasn't documenting everything but um yeah i i just think like there's there are very few traces of that entire part of my life and that is a little bit sad it's all just my memory and the people around me that i'm verifying like did actually happen that doesn't seem like someone could have sat on my foot and broken it and they're like yeah that happened yeah the muse thing seems like such an example of a it's sort of an empty honor like it's it's something that you are told to value, taught to value. The attention feels incredibly validating. Um, but at the end, it sort of evaporates, despite the fact that you did an enormous amount of work and it only exists because of your body and your work. But it's sort of this like empty honor that was sort of bestowed but doesn't actually have a ton of value to it. Right. And it is so gendered too, because like there, in order to be amused, there has to be some, some genius who's inspired by you. And the genius is all of the man, you know, the woman is never the genius. Right. So, I mean, in sort of in old stories of famous writers, Picasso uh, as well, you know, there are so many artists who had muses and they, the the men were the geniuses. And I just thought like, I, I don't, believe in that story that's not the story i want for myself i i want to <laughs> i want to create the thing i want to be the genius yeah and the you know the way the way that so much ballet history has been written it's sort of an inversion of the of the adage that behind every great man is a is a woman 
the way that ballet history has been written as I have read it is that behind every great ballerina who you've seen, you know, lithographs or whatever was like a genius man, her father, her teacher, or her father and teacher, her husband, her impresario, who was making ballets for her and sort of making her exist in the world. And so it wasn't, it wasn't all her, you know, the image of her, like the image of Marie Taglioni survives, but really it was her father who choreographed the ballet that made her. And unsurprisingly, all of those men are described euphemistically as fiery and demanding and yeah. all of these terms that basically make it sound like it was hell to work for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, these women were only allowed to uh, contributions because they got permission from somebody yeah. and there was no way they could give themselves permission because that was not set up in society they lived in. Yeah. Um, one thing I really admire about this book is that it really resists a tidy narrative arc. Um, mm -hmm. I can imagine that it would be very easy to say, you know, when people ask, why did you stop dancing? It's very easy to give the answer, I got injured. Yeah. Um, and the truth is, vastly more complicated than that. I mean, that's part of the reason it was, as you say in the book, it's sort of the beginning of the end, but so many of us have such a sort of tight relationship to this thing that we love that even an injury is not enough to end it completely. There's a, like, there's a tail, there's mm -hmm. a, there's more that comes after that. There's efforts to heal, there's efforts to come back. And, you know, the tidy way to tell the story is, not the one that you chose, which I imagine um, was a difficult choice when it's like the narrative is, you know, you could pretend. So how did you, how did you decide that the fall was going to be the middle and not the end? Um, well, I think it was important for me to start with the fall in the prologue mm -hmm. because it brought up questions about what comes next that mm -hmm. I think I was unclear about at the time. Um, and so in the book, I continue dancing for three more years. I think after I fall and injure myself, one year I kind of took off. I lived in Paris and realized that there was a lot more, you know, I was, I was just studying abroad, but I thought, okay, there's a, there's a whole world out here. And it made me sad to be inside of a dance studio when I was in Paris. I thought like I could do this anywhere. I want to be out in the, in the streets, um, doing things, although now that I say that, I think like no one's out in the streets in Paris right now. Um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would pay, I'd empty my bank account to be in a ballet studio in Paris right now. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I know, I would, I would. Um, but I, you know, I started off going into ballet studios and then I just thought this looks like my life anywhere else. And so that was kind of eye opening. Just, I mean, it sounds so silly to say like studying abroad was so you know, changed my life in such a dramatic way, but it was just getting out into the world and seeing other options and other ways of living. Um, so I think that with, with ballet, you know, there's no, it, it is actually really hard to have a career ending injury. And I, and the yeah. book is sort of framed that way, but there were so many injuries that led up to a career ending injury. And actually that injury is not what ended my career. I ended my career just by thinking like, I can't put myself through this anymore. Yeah. I could continue to dance, but I was in pain. And before I was dropped and hurt myself, I had, I mean, I hurt a weak spot in my body, which is I think often how these injuries go. Um, so I talk about a couple different back injuries along the way that led to this big back injury. But finally, it had to come from sort of a more internal place. Like, I think it's unsatisfying narratively to watch an external force like somebody fall in a rehearsal um, that changes someone's trajectory. I think it had to be me coming to, um, you know, some realization that made me quit ballet. So the realization was I could do other things. I got, I actually, I mean, and the, it's so funny in memoir like this really happened, but it's almost like if it were in fiction, you would think this was too heavy handed. The day of my last performance, the way I knew it was my last performance is I got an acceptance to graduate school. And I was just like, great, I'm going to go perform for the last time. I didn't really fully know it was the last time, but I was like, I'm going to walk off stage and have something else to do. I have other options. I have other 
things that I'm good at or interested in or whatever. So that's, that's exactly what happened. I walked off the stage and just like never have taken a ballet class again, um, which is so dramatic, but I didn't mean for it to be. That's just sort of like I needed, I had one foot out the door. I needed to know that I had like an, you know, an X strategy. And once I did, I was like, great, ballet has brought me a lot of joy and pain and it no longer is going to be the focus of my life. Um, but that was, that was years after the actual dramatic, I keep calling it the showstopper fall in the book. Yeah. So, um, which is really stop, you know, which is so on you, that kind of injury is so underrepresented among dance injuries. The vast majority of dance injuries are repetitive stress injuries, which as you say, make you more vulnerable to a showstopper kind of event. Um, but I also wonder if, uh, sort of emotionally, psychologically, it's easier to tell ourselves the story. I quit because I got hurt rather than saying I quit because I just got sick of hurting all the time. Yep, exactly. Um, not because you, you know, and this comes up over and over again in the book, the ability to withstand constant pain, like constant niggling pain, constant just discomfort is valorized and reified. And it is what makes you, worthy of being a dancer is the ability to withstand withstand pain constantly and so if you stop one day and say i can't do that then what you're really saying is i am not a dancer mm-hmm. and it's just such right. a so tied up in the identity of dancer that to say i don't want to do that anymore yeah i was thinking so much about that exact thing when that netflix show cheer came out recently you watched Cheer, didn't you? I devoured so, Cheer. Yeah, I thought we talked about this. Okay, <laughs> so Cheer, I mean, a lot of, there are so many injuries and there is one, in fact, that happens during their big performance, not to not to ruin it, but you know, it's been out for a few months. So yeah. there's, one, there's one young man who is horribly injured during their big competition. But, you know, most of the injuries happen in, the, in their rehearsals, practices. I don't even know if they're called the practices, I guess. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember um, that movie, The Cutty with Nev Campbell. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where a dancer's jumping and she ruptures her Achilles tendon. Oh. It collapses, I know, it's disgusting. And I talk in the book about how my cousin, who is um, also a dancer, saw that happen in a studio once. And when she told me that I was little and I was, I was just so horrified because, I mean, I. I actually won't describe the injury because it's so disgusting, but she, she described exactly what she saw and heard and what happened. And apparently that is an injury that you can get surgery for and, you know, walk again, although ugh, I don't know how you- It's an injury that you can, like, you can, there's a, there's a US male Olympic gymnast who like ruptured his Achilles and is, you know, going to compete yeah. in Tokyo 2027. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it sounds like the worst thing in the world and yet yeah it's treatable exactly so um when my when my cousin really scared me telling me that she had seen this in a ballet class I of course thought well that's that's going to happen to me because that's a possibility I'm injury prone and I remember her telling me no that you know you it's it's not something spontaneous it's not like someone takes a knife to a tendon it's like they're is so much sort of repetitive injury over and over and over that the tendon wears out and breaks down and then something horrible happens. Um, so even when there are these big catastrophic moments that can end your career, it, yeah, it's always, there are always warning signs, I, I think. I mean, you're not doing anything where you're like so far off the ground that you're going to fall and break your skull or something. You know, it's always like a muscular thing or a skeletal thing that you've just not listened to, not, yeah. not heeded well, warning signs. Not listened to and also rushed to dance on too yes. soon yeah um, and sort there's of, always someone willing to take your place right you haven't allowed it to heal properly and so it's weak and so it gets injured again and again and again um i always thought and, too i was really rewarded for getting injured and then coming back like i i felt like people were like wow she really loves you know she's really committed you know and i i really felt like i was impressing people yeah by coming back too soon yeah because i think i was Impress- and specifically impressing adults who then yeah. praised you in front of children who internalized exactly. the message that that's that's what it means to be really dedicated to this exactly um, she's really tough you know she she gets hurt but then she comes back yeah 
Um, one thing that I have come across in my research is um, in the orthopedic, in the dance, ortho, um, dance medicine literature, there are repeated warnings against putting dancers with lower extremity injuries, which are the most, obviously the most common ballet injuries, foot, ankle, anything below the knee. Um, repeated warnings from doctors to doctors against putting dancers in removable cam boots in like the gray plastic boots because they'll just take them off and dance on them. So the literature repeatedly says, put them in a plaster cast so they can't just take the cam boot off and dance on it. And when I read that, I was like, yeah, of course they will. Of course. I would have done it. Of course they will. I, mean, I like, used to dance with these bandages. I remember people dancing with like, you know, casts on their arms too. And it's like, you know, if you have a broken arm, I, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that should hurt in ballet. And yet you have a broken bone in your body. Like, why are you, why are you doing anything? But yeah, I certainly used to dance with knee braces and ankle braces. And I felt like, well, this injury is fine because I can, I can still just dance with this. Right. Yeah, I distinctly remember thinking of, and this is partly a function of gymnastics, which is I, which I also grew up in. I distinctly remember thinking of athletic tape as like a status symbol. Like the yeah. more you think of it, the the better you were, the more you serious. Look, you were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember also feeling really proud of when I would take off my point shoes and see blood, or when my toenail would fall off. Like, I was like, wow, I'm I've been working really hard, you know, rather than why am I dancing on one toe? Why am I putting all my body weight on one toe? Yeah. And I, you know, I think that like that, like gnarly, disgusting underbelly, not underbelly, but like the internal experience, the physical experience required to create the sort of visual and aesthetic perfection, that dichotomy has sort of that that I think has become the popular narrative about ballet. Mm -hmm. That like underneath all the beauty, there's a disgusting ugliness. Like yeah, I mean, there's nothing there's nothing like groundbreaking about that, but it's also just true. Like I I don't know how how many ballet Instagram accounts you follow, but there's there are all those photos of like on one side it's at like a perfect. I was just going to bring this up. Yeah, one foot you know, she's against a wall. One foot is a perfect pristine point shoe and the other foot is just like a gnarled. Yeah. With the, yeah. Perfect. And like Alice. that, and that dichotomy, I think is a lot of people have internalized that like the more you suffer on the inside, the more beautiful the final result is going to be. Right. I think it also, people love to see behind the scenes. I think. Yeah. Um, and the grosser, the better. Yeah, exactly. So, um, we know that ballet has a lot of artifice involved in its um, in its power. And so I think people love to see like what's under the point shoe because they think it gives them some sort of, you know, expanded knowledge of ballet that I, I suppose is true. I mean, we couldn't have really seen that before the digital age. But um, I remember we also had a picture studio wall i don't know whose feet they were but it was a man's feet crossed in fifth position and his shoes were really torn up and had like i think he had a toe poking through or something and he had leg warmers on is it the yellow and is it he, yellow leg warmers i think so I think, yeah I, know right. that photo. I had that photo on my wall when i was 15. yeah <laughs> <laughs> iconic, iconic ballet image yeah. um but seeing that rather than the brand new shoes for the performance with the rosin on the bottom, ready to dance, yeah. you know, the role of Albrecht and Giselle or something, it makes you feel like, okay, this is what it really takes to do ballet. Yeah. Or, you know, to do anything that's worth doing. Yeah. Um, one thing, and then I, I have a couple more questions, but there's a great moment in David Holberg's memoir, um, Body mm -hmm. of Work, where he talks about sort of, um, company dance wear fashions in, I guess it would have been the late nineties or early two thousands. And the term that he uses is junk. Like the more ripped up your dance gear was the, like the again, it's like the athletic tape, right? Like the more broken down <laughs> and busted yeah. you look, the more like prestige and status you are assumed to have. 
Absolutely. And yeah, and I remember a girl coming into class with brand new shoes. Mm-mm. I know that's that's so embarrassing. I remember <laughs> at some point, like our dance teachers would just snap and be like, "You you can't wear all this junk. You have to. I have to be able to see your bodies because we were just like covered in like woolly sweaters and you know really basically everyone looks like something in the thriller video. Like everything yeah, is exactly. torn. Yeah. Yeah. Zombies. Um, can we talk briefly about your pregnancy? Is that all right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so for people watching, Ellen is due on Thursday. Yeah. Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. <laughs> We're very lucky to have her with us today. I know, um, this one can go. Um, there's, a, there's this wonderful book uh, called Balancing Acts, which is, uh, it's a photography book about um, three principal dancers at uh, San Francisco Ballet as they become mothers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sort of follows them through pregnancy and um, through... The, the kids' early childhood and getting back onto the stage. And uh, there's a lot of discussion of like, ballet requires complete control of your body and pregnancy is the exact opposite of that. Like a very welcome parasite takes over your body and just gets to run the show. Um, and, you know, weight gain and cravings and just your body takes on a shape that it has never taken on before. And I'm really curious what that has been like for you. Um, it's been hard. I mean, I'm somebody who even without ballet and even being whatever this means on the other side of, you know, a years, years long eating disorder, um, I'm still pretty disciplined about my about my body and about the way I sort of like exercise or eat or whatever. That's just so much a part of how, you know, how I spent my adolescence was trying to control and tame that even when I don't need to do that, I, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's like something that I really have to fight against. Mm. So pregnancy is, yeah, I mean, it's something happening to your body that you have absolutely no control over. And I really have to sort of like consciously talk to myself, mm. you know, if I, if I notice that I'm being particularly judgmental or frustrated or whatever, I really have to like tell myself, this is, this is something I want. This is something that will be worth it. Those other messages that I'm compete that are competing are, um, you know, not, they're, they're, they're not real. Like they're just, they're just messaging from who knows where from patriarchal ideas of, you know, having to control and discipline your body. Um, yeah, that's hard. I think that's probably hard for every woman, but also there's a lot of, um, you know, as you expand, there are muscles in your stomach that can kind of split open and dancers are particularly, I know that you, would, I think you and I have talked about this on the yeah. phone, dancers are particularly prone to this condition um, where your stomach muscles separate as your stomach expands because we have spent our whole lives, you know, turning out our legs and hips and whatever. So uh, it's, just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of just sort of awareness, but also surrender, which is, I think probably, you know, I've thought about it and maybe more than some women, I don't know, but it seems like it's good training for labor because that's what I hear that I'm about to have to go through is a lot of surrender and just being okay with what's happening that I have absolutely no say over. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it other than it's, it's very hard and I can't imagine having to go back and dancing quickly because I think, you know, there are so many limits place what you can do what you have the energy to do what you have the ability to do what you have the space to do that it would be really hard to go look yourself in the mirror afterwards in in a video and see like wow my legs are not as high or I have less energy or whatever I'd love to read that book um the good news is there are so many professional ballet dancers having babies these days that I think we may you know we may get maybe not that book but at least oh sorry oh do you mean you mean the the book I mentioned yeah, the book you mentioned, oh, but yeah, also, no. if I, that, I would love to read that too. Yeah. Um, the book is by Lucy Gray. It's called Balancing Acts. I really recommend it. Um, mm-hmm. Really, really gorgeous photos. Um, I'm going to ask Ellen one more question. And while I'm doing that, if um, folks in the audience have any questions that they would like to uh, type into the chat box, now is the time um, to do that. Um, if and when, or if your child wants to do 
Valley, what are the conditions under which you would be okay with that? Um, I would be okay with it if it was something, I mean, first of all, I'd want to, I'd want to vet the studio. I'd want to make sure that the, that the teachers were responsible. I mean, I actually, I think that the studio that I went to did have responsible teachers who talked to us a lot about these things. And yet, you know, the, the culture of girls was, I think, really what, well, and also just the culture of competition um, made it difficult to sort of reinforce the messages they were telling us. But I would, I would want to vet the studio. I'd want to see who the older dancers were. I'd want to see what kinds of shows they put on. And I think if they were really competitive, I, I might not want to put her there. Mm. Um, I also think I was so singularly focused on ballet only, you know, no other dance form. Um, I might, if I put her in ballet, also put her in some other dance forms so that she could get a fuller range of movement expression and education. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about character dancing while we're waiting for participants to raise their hands, their digital hands with questions? So yeah. this, okay. So I grew up uh, taking a, taking ballet in Australia, doing the Royal Academy of Dance curriculum. Um, which as Ellen explains in the book is one of six uh, sort of codified dance curricula, a ballet curricula around the world. Um, and uh, there were other options in Australia, but the school that I went to happened to be an RAD school. And I don't know if this is true of other uh, curricula, but RAD requires that every student take character dancing and I would love you, Ellen, to explain to our audience what that means, because it's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. So I, I also grew up doing RAD, which I talk about in the book. Um, and there is, so this curricula um, start, I think I started taking examinations in this at around age six or seven. And to prepare for the examinations, there are a series of combinations at the bar and then at center in center that you have to memorize. And so you go in and then perform them for an examiner in groups of four. But at the, at the end, or maybe towards the middle of class, there's a little section called character, um, character dance, which is, I think it's Hungarian or Hungarian, maybe in Romanian, but in any case, sort of Eastern European, like peasant style dancing, um, which is so strange in, in English, ballet class. I Let me tell why. you how weird it is in Australia. It makes even less sense in Sydney. Yeah. Australia. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in the U.S. too, like I did it, I, when I'm, I lived in England for a couple of years, that's where I started ballet. But when I moved back to the U.S., we did it too. And it's like Hungary and Romania could not be more removed from my life in California. <laughs> and yet here I am performing. And I don't even know if it's authentic peasant dancing. I, I mean, for all I know, it could be like some you know, very elite English person's idea of Hungarian dancing, but I don't, I have no idea of the authenticity of it, but you wear these long black skirts and they have like three or I think four colored ribbons around the bottom. Um, and you wear character shoes that are different when you're little from when you're older and you go into the heel gets higher. And, but it's a lot of like Hungarian sound music or Eastern European sounding music and so like, like hands on hips and like hip flex, hands on hips and like heel, heel on the toe, a lot of like yeah, like flexing clapping. your foot and pointing it and yeah, a lot of clapping, yeah, like clapping yeah. on the beat, you know, on the, the fourth count or something. So it's, it's very bizarre and I don't know why they include it and I don't know how authentic it is. And I was researching it a little bit for this book and just the only thing I could find was what the Royal Academy of Dance had put out. I couldn't find much about it. And they were just like, you know, to supplement ballet, we, <laughs> we also train dancers in character dancing. Like I've and never seen it anywhere else. Which like as a pedagogical choice, if you're actually preparing dancers for ballet dancers for Korea in a ballet company these days, you would want them to take like contemporary, more contemporary yeah. stuff or you know it's like not useful it's well <laughs> so, as we were discussing a couple days ago it is useful in the story ballets like swan lake and sleeping beauty where you do sort of a world tour of ethnic dance styles yeah. or what the russians of the 1870s thought were ethnic yeah. dance styles exactly or even in the nutcracker which people yes. uh, are probably familiar with there's sort yes. of this yeah this world tour it's like 
all these developing nations at the end that, you know, get like a two minute little dance. And it's, I, it's, again, who knows how authentic it is. It's the Russians in the 1870s, you know, telling us what Arabian dancers looked like or, you know, right. Spanish dancers or whatever, but it's ballet still. So it's probably not at all what Arabian dancers look like. Um, I have nothing but fond memories of character, even though yeah, it was kind of nice. Incredibly weird and strange. I, I remember enjoying it. And uh, to this day, I have a fondness for twirly, for like skirts with excellent twirl. Yeah. Um, no, it, it was nice because also it was like a break from point and a break from, mm -hmm. it was a break from ballet. I mean, it just felt like a strange little pocket of class time that we could devote to something that made no sense and then go back to like the serious study. Yeah. Um, which I had mostly forgotten about until I read your book and I was like, right, I did spend my childhood doing that. And that is weird. You know, I also forgot about it. And I remembered, I remembered it when I found all of my old examination, you know, like all my grades and my ballet exams and it would grade me on character. And I was like, right, character dance. What a weird thing. What a weird thing. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, do you want to do another reading? Is there something else you want to talk about? Um, I, I don't mind. I, there are people don't have any questions. People are not being shy. I can tell. I'm, uh, okay. not, not that people have entered so far. Um, Probably so mostly, now. you know, like my family anyway, who have asked questions. Um, yeah, I can do, I can do another reading or if you have any more questions, you can, um, I think that's, I think that's, that's all I have. Um, okay. So why don't you close us out with, with a little more and then we can direct people to the link to buy multiple copies of it and then call it all right. Okay. That sounds great. So the other reading that I'm going to do very quickly is um, the actual fall in the rehearsal, um, which is in my prologue. So I'll read it to you and then we'll all disperse. There was one lift I spent the whole first half of the piece dreading and the second half giddy from remembering. The lift began with me running toward him. And when he caught me, he'd flip me over one shoulder behind his neck and I came down over the other shoulder. When the lift went well, we looked at each other afterwards, each of us miracles who had thrown ourselves headlong into a piece of choreography, caring only that we didn't fall behind the music. That was my fault choreographer when it didn't go as well. He took the blame each time. This time I came down clumsily, still half caught in his arms. The choreographer stopped the music and as her back was turned, Peter said to me, make sure your rib cage is facing me so I can get my arm underneath and grow. He made a swinging motion with his arms and I understood that I was the invisible shape he was cradling in his gesture. Time and again, when a little wrong or our timing was not matched, he called the fault his and then privately told me what I should do differently. We rehearsed together after daily classes when we were sweaty from Grand Allegro and warmed up enough to try the lift full out. It required him to catch me in mid-step, lift me upside down and backward all at once. When I was first learning the steps, I would watch videos of the other girls who executed it perfectly. The absolute trust they had in their bodies to mold improbably with the male dancer and create a complementary moving shape. I had never been lifted upside down and backward but once before, and I did not know that it took two people to let one fall. In our rehearsal, we did the steps that led me to him. He ran away, he looked back, I ran to him. I would then jump and he would stop and catch me. That's what was supposed to happen. And like we had rehearsed so many times, I ran toward him and jumped, only to watch as he continued forward, not stopping, leaving me behind mid-flight. And then I was falling, a low moving kite of music and bones, a pitched breath. I held my breath during that moment when I had no control over our movement. Everything was up to Peter and the ballet and all the training I had ever had. And the floor grew and grew until my straight arm hit it, then legs, and my hip that jutted from my black tights like some rare bird. As I rolled onto my back, I felt a fate worse than gravity. Um, I found that really, really hard to read in the moment. I had to will myself to read that part. It's really, it's, 
it's really tough. Mm -hmm. Not for the quality of the writing, just because you know what's about to happen. Yep. Um, we do have a question um, mm -hmm. from Sally Greenhouse. Um, the chat function does not seem to be working. Um, so Sally, in the Q&A uh, where you are right now, could you type the question in um, and I can uh, repeat it to Ellen and we can get that answered for you. Um, I am not as Zoom proficient as one would expect. As much Zoom as I've done over the last few weeks, I still don't quite know yeah. how things work. Yeah, failing at being a digital native. No. It's a little embarrassing. Um, well, part of me is like, I don't want to admit that we have to do this now. So, you know, this is the way life is. So if I resist Zoom, then I'm just denying <laughs> that this is our new reality. It's like people who resist email. Like, yes, it's just yeah. a sale. Um, Chris and the powerhouse folk, can we make sure that Sally has a way to... Ah, Sally's question. Oh, uh, I'll ask Genia's question while we're waiting for Sally to get hers in. The writing is beautiful, the injury harrowing. Who was the choreographer? The choreographer was just somebody at college. Actually, there was a, a review recently that said that the choreographer was Balanchine. But it, the ballet was called Serenade, but it was not Balanchine Serenade. So it was just like a teacher at my college who choreographed it. And that was the person who, you know, ran over to him. Things went really awry. Mm -hmm. um, I misunderstood as well. I thought it was Balanchine Serenade okay. as well. Um, Chris and the powerhouse folks, can we unmute um, Sally's audio, please, so that we can... Uh... Hi, Sally. Hello. Hi. There it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Thanks a lot. I have difficulty typing on my end because I, um, I'm a former ballet dancer who suffered a broken neck, and part of the symptom is that I type backwards. <laughs> so oh. it's type anything longer than a, a few words and phrases I have to really plan to email. But um, I, I, I haven't yet, I'm so eager to read this book. Um, I think it's going to be an incredibly significant contribution and that girls who are now in training and in companies will benefit so much. And I must confess that I have corresponded with Ellen, the author, um, I had gone to Sarah Lawrence undergrad and she did her MFA at Sarah Lawrence. Um, and in listening to this, I'm even more intrigued by the narrative. Um, so I, I'd like to make a few comments and then ask a very direct, straightforward question of Ellen. Um, it, one is that on the gendered issue, that we were all called boys and girls and that mm -hmm. In the company setting, I, I would say that I'm equivocal about agreeing that I felt um, oppressed by what was maybe sounding like a counter-feminist art form. Um, I, I felt as though, and my impression from Ellen has been that it, it didn't really um, diminish us as girls and women that we're actually very strong, but we had to present this image of uh, being fragile, uh, maybe what you were pointing out, Chloe. Um, but I also think that the men were very much supportive to us and that there's a brilliant singular poem by the late James L. White who danced with ABT called I Trade These Words which is very much about no longer being able to dance again and the intimacy between partners um, in ballet. Um, and, uh, and I've also gone through, I'm from another generation. I'm from a, like a hundred years ago where there was no consciousness about injury prevention. Mm. But, um, uh, I would have to say that since corresponding with Ellen about her book, uh, I, I've reflected upon um, the spiritual dimension of ballet, not simply this perfectionistic athleticism, but the deep spirituality that I think we all cultivated in the silence, in the inability to speak, and being very, very in touch 
with our bodies in a way that other non-dancers think is abnormal, mm -hmm. but is normative for us. And I can tell from seeing you in person, Ellen, that your gestures are very balletic and very graceful and quite beautiful. And it's now in this time of quarantine and plague, um, when I was watching videos of the Paris Opera Ballet uh, working out in their homes, I was literally crying from the beauty of seeing an art form that I used to be able to participate in and still had the feelings that you describe, the feelings of being envious of the other girl's feet and their arches and, you know, everybody else seems to attain a level of perfection we will never attain. But that is the definition of the art form, which is so very different than others. And it is true, Chloe, I agree, that the men who have become the superstars um, make their names are known, Baryshnikov, Nureyev, Nijinsky, mm -hmm. whereas the women, uh, they're not household words. Even Margot Fontaine, Marcia mm -hmm. Haide, Suzanne Farrell, Wendy Whalen, you know, we, we actually don't get our names known and we don't nearly make as much money as they do. And that's an inequity for mm -hmm. sure. And, um, and by the way, David Halberg is dancing with a hole in his um, Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the question, I think, of injuries is such a fascinating, complex one. And I think, again, the contribution that this book will make is very significant. I'm so eager to read it. And this is my question for you, Ellen. Very simple, very direct. Do you regret, do you regret any moment of having trained and become a ballet dancer? No, not for a second. Um, I mean, I, I think that I still, it's, it's the greatest joy I've ever known. And I think the pain of losing it was so great because I loved it so much. Um, but it's, no, I mean, I, I, it was my entire identity. It was my entire childhood. It was all my motivation. Um, you know, even in high school, I was always, I was the ballet dancer. That's who I was. So I, I, I don't regret any of it. It was very difficult, I think, to have to reconceive of who else I could be if I wasn't a ballet dancer. Um, but I've never felt so powerful, so beautiful, you know, as I did when I danced. And, uh, that's why that's why I still have sort of a complicated feeling around my own love of ballet because I still love to watch it. I love to go see it live. Um, being in an auditorium or a theater with a group of people having the same experience watching, you know, dancers on stage, it's not quite as good as actually being on stage yourself because that's just the headiest thing I can, you know, I've ever experienced. But it's pretty amazing and I still feel like when I watch it, you know, I see the dancers and I'm kind of moving with them because I know what their bodies are doing. Um, and it still feels like you're in this, I don't know, this sort of vacuum with them um, that nothing, I mean, I don't feel like that when I go listen to a, a really smart writer talk about their writing. It's just not the same experience. It's such a physical experience. So the feeling of, of the loss, I think, quite physical and like you I, I think I probably saw the exact same Paris opera video of the dancers you know all, all dancing in their houses and uh yeah I, st I still of course feel envy like I couldn't do that or I, I I used to be able to do that or and you know I not that I was ever that good but just I used to be able to do those kinds of um exercises that they were doing and now I can't and I still feel that loss I think quite physically Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a that's a good place to to close it out. Um, Chris, would you like to tell the good people where they can buy multiple copies of Ellen's book? Yes, yes. Uh, there is a, a link in the chat and uh, on the event page too. And thank you so much, Chloe and Ellen, and thank you to everyone who asked questions. Uh, and if you missed any of the event, we'll have it on YouTube soon. So. Please buy a book, uh, buy more than one book. Uh, it helps us put on more of these great free events. Uh, and bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you so much, Chris and Powerhouse.
thanks for having it. Thanks for having us and uh, good luck in the next big adventure, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.